So welcome everyone to Down Ancient Trails and we are delighted to have with us here today Brianna Pabina and we'll begin just now. Welcome to Down Ancient Trails, the online archaeology forum of the Sharma Center for Heritage Education India. Brush the dust off long forgotten thoughts. Slice through time and space. Listen to stories in stone. Whispers of voices lost in time. Build bridges across worlds. Curious minds reach out to the past. And travel down ancient trails. Welcome, Brianna, and over to you, Prachi. Screen visible? Yes. Yes. Okay. Hi, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Down Mansion Trail Series. Today, we have with us Dr. Brianna Pubinath. Dr. Brianna is a paleoanthropologist who do archaeological and taphonomic research centers on the evolution of human diet with a focus on meat eating, but has included topics as diverse as human cannibalism and chimpanzee or carnivore. Since joining the Smithsonian in 2005 to help put together the Hall of Human Origins, in addition to continue, continuing her active field, laboratory and experimental research program. She leads the human origins programs education and outreach efforts, including managing the human origins programs, public programs, website content, social media, and exhibition uh, volunteer training. Dr. Brianna has recently developed an additional uh, research program in evolution, education, and science communication. She, she is also an associate professor of, of anthropology in the Center for the Advanced Study of Human Value Biology at the George Washington University. Today, she will be speaking on the role of scavenging, uh, uh, scavenging and the uh, abstract is available on our website. Uh, you all know that our web, uh, we have a Sharma Center a YouTube channel where we will be putting all these uh, online uh, uh, online uh, like uh, talks uh, to get uh, for this uh, you can like and subscribe our YouTube channel and one small request for everyone please do not record this uh, talk it will be available on our YouTube channel and no screenshots please with this small introduction. Uh, I will hand over the screen to uh, Diana now. Welcome, Diana. Thank you for having me. I will share my screen. Um, great. And I will do that. And then I will do that. Wonderful. Well, thank you to Shanti and Akilesh and your team for inviting me to um, talk today about my research on the role of scavenging animal foods in hominin diets. Um, and on this slide is a bronze sculpture, um, a reconstruction of Homo erectus um, carrying, she's carrying kind of a goat sized gazelle carcass. And this is a reconstruction that is in the Smithsonian's Hall of Human Origins. Um, and the question that is being asked by this reconstruction, which is by paleo artist John Gurchy, is did she hunt or scavenge this animal? All right, so I would say that there have been three significant evolutionary changes in human diets over time or hominin diets over time. The first one is the incorporation of food, of animal tissues from big animals. And this shift happened sometimes, sometime between about 2.6 and 3.4 million years ago. Um, the second is cooking food and the controlled use of fire. Um, and that happened at least a million years ago based on the evidence that we have currently. 
Um, and then the last one is the domestication of edible plants and animals, which happened at least 12,000 years ago. Um, and some plants and animals were domesticated even before that. Um, and I just want to draw a little bit of attention to cooking, which is really important in making animal and plant foods, um, basically making more types of food more physically and chemically accessible for us to digest. And um, one interesting sign from genetics that cooking has shaped our ancestors' genomes as well as our guts is that um, modern humans, homo sapiens, Neanderthals, and Denisovans, who all share common ancestor dating back perhaps 800,000 years ago, maybe earlier, have all lost a masked mask masticatory myosin gene called MYH16 that help build strong chewing muscles in the jaws of chimps. Um, so this shared um, adaptation may have something to do with um, our, with cooking in our prehistory. So what makes early human carnivory unique? And I mean unique among the primates. So at some point in prehistory, our ancestors began to slice meat from bones and bash those bones open to access fat and calorie rich marrow. And I think there were four novel things about this dietary behavior that was different compared with how we presume earlier hominins ate their animal prey. The first is that it involved tool use. So these really early hominins didn't have teeth that were adapted for cutting through carcasses and being able to access these animal tissues. So the use of stone tools was necessary. It also included eating large animals, so animals much larger than themselves. Um, the reconstruction you see here is of a, an ancient butchery site at Alorga Sile in southern Kenya, where we found um, an extinct type of elephant that was surrounded by more than 2,000 stone tools dating back to almost a million years ago. So we're pretty sure we know what happened at this um, site. And this um, elephant that was butchered is even larger than African elephants today. It also likely included deferred consumption or deferred eating. And that's basically eating, not eating something right away when you find it. This is a weird thing that humans do. We don't um, go into the grocery store, sit down, open the packages and start eating all of our food immediately. We defer the consumption of food. We probably, you know, today we bring that food home, we store it, we share it with other people, sometimes complete strangers. Um, but we see even back to some of the earliest um, animal tissue consumption, that there's probably transporting of carcass parts to special or central places, probably for communal consumption. And the last thing, and what I'll be focusing on today, is that it likely included scavenging, which put us into either indirect or sometimes direct competition with larger carnivores. So if I was to give you a menu of evidence of, you know, the types of evidence we could use for investigating diets in the past, we would look at chimpanzees who are our closest living relatives to see maybe what, use them as a model for um, what the earliest hominin diets would have been like. We can also look at modern human foragers. Um, we can use actualistic studies. We can use studies of the present to understand the past. And then we can also use evidence from zooarchaeology. And these are the four lines of evidence that I'll be talking about today. But we can also use hominin fossils. We can look at the morphology of those fossils, even look at the chemistry of those fossils to get um, some clues into early human diets. We can look at the archaeological record, and we can even look at ancient molecules. So there are sites where um, researchers have investigated um, basically traces of um, proteins or other ancient evidence for ancient evidence for blood residues that are actually left on the edges of stone tools. So first I wanna talk a little bit about chimpanzee meat eating. What do we know about our closest living relatives? Um, so chimpanzees and bonobos, eat meat and other animal tissues from over 35 species of vertebrates. And interestingly, in contrast, gorillas do not hunt and kill vertebrates and orangutans do only rarely. Um, but chimpanzees generally consume animals much smaller than themselves, probably because larger animals are much less frequently encountered in their preferred, more tropical forest habitats. They cooperatively hunt, catch, and kill juveniles and infants, particularly of their favored prey, which are usually small, agile, arboreal monkeys. And so from this, we might reasonably assume that our last common ancestor with chimpanzees also incorporated animal foods into its diet, making this kind of behavior the ancestral condition for our lineage. 
but why do chimpanzees hunt and eat meat? Um, and so on average across all chimpanzee groups, meat only makes up about 3% of chimpanzee diets. Um, so in some locales, they tend to hunt more in the dry season when their preferred foods, their plant foods are more scarce. But in other areas, they hunt more in times of food abundance. And so there's ideas that chimpanzee hunting may be a function of male social bonding rather than just a dietary strategy to mitigate seasonal nutritional shortfalls. But what about scavenging in chimpanzees? So chimpanzees scavenge only rarely, and they usually approach potential scavenging opportunities with in consuming a dead carcass. Um, so they don't seem to see dead animals as food. Interestingly, um, baboons have great social excitement um, in uh, fresh kills. And um, chimpanzees actually also get um, socially, have great social excitement in their own kills or when they actually steal fresh kills from baboons. Um, and no attempt at confrontational scavenging by chimpanzees has been reported. Um, so basically that's kind of attempting to intervene in another predator um, eating their prey. Um, but chimpanzees do eat marrow and brains as well as meat. And a key difference between human, modern human, and modern non-human primate exploitation of animal tissue is probably the habitual consumption of large animal resources. Um, so Jessica Thompson and her colleagues have recently termed this the human predatory pattern. So rather than an extension of the cooperative hunting of small prey that may have been this ancestral behavioral condition that we still see in chimpanzees, they propose that the regular exploitation of large animal resources by hominins began with an emphasis on percussion-based scavenging of within bone nutrients, and that's marrow and brains. And so this proposal builds on work emphasizing the importance of these kinds of within bone nutrients in early hominin subsistence strategies. So now I'll turn to human foragers. Um, and this is a great graphic from a Scientific American article from several years ago. So what can that tell us about meat eating? So the proportion of meat in forager or hunter-gatherer diets is very variable, but meat provides nutrients that are important, particularly for female reproductive success in all forager societies. Meat is shared more often and more widely with unrelated people than other resources, and meat and fat are often given special values in forager societies. The upper limit of protein, and this is both plant and animal protein combined, that modern humans can safely handle on a sustained basis is about 50% of normal caloric intake. And with animal protein, that high proportion is only feasible with prey that also has fat in substantial quantities. Most human populations only obtain about 10 or 20% of their total energy requirements from protein, although the full range is really variable from less than 5% to 90%. Um, so protein is unlikely to have been a limiting nutrient for present or past foragers. So I'm not going to review scavenging by forager groups um, in this talk. Passive scavenging, and so that's waiting until, um, you know, the main predator is done and coming in and eating the leftovers, is generally considered part of a flexible foraging strategy used by modern foragers, um, but as a supplementary carcass acquisition strategy. And for instance, a study of the Hadza foragers of Tanzania found that scavenging yielded between about 15 and 25 percent of carcasses taken in all seasons and that they routinely listen for predator kills, they monitor vulture flight, and they visit areas where lions have been active. Fat in particular may have been a prime target for hominin animal tissue extraction given its high caloric density. Fatty meat is most often identified as preferred or desirable by modern foragers. And when the Hadza and the Kung or the San in Southern Africa eat animal tissues, particularly during the dry season when meat is lean, they often heavily process the carcasses for grease by smashing bones and boiling them in pots to be able to get that, um, that fat. Okay, so I'm gonna turn to the hunting scavenging debate in zooarchaeology. So um, this debate has been part of the paleoanthropology scholarly literature for decades, and it really centers on questions about the timing, the frequency, the resource yield, and the behavioral and biological implications of hominins acquiring food from the carcasses of large animals. So beginning several decades ago, 
correlates of hunting and hominins were invoked to explain everything from the origin of bipedalism to the origin of technology and the origin of adaptations to open grassland environments. So on the left, you see Richard Lee and Irvin DeVore's Man the Hunter, uh, a book published in 1968, which was basically a collection of papers presented at a 1966 symposium on research done among modern foragers, which outlined ethnographic and some archaeological evidence for these ideas. And on the right, you see um, a book by Jane Goodall in the Shadow of Man. And so this idea of man the hunter also found some support in studies of apes, including chimpanzees, particularly with um, Jane Goodall's observations of chimpanzee hunting, first published in 1971. But really the idea of the primacy of hunting in human evolutionary history, as well as the zooarchaeological evidence for this behavior has deeper roots with Raymond Dart's proposal of the osteodontocaratic or the bone tooth horn culture in the late 1940s and 1950s. Um, so Dart is um, an, uh, a researcher in South Africa and he was studying the patterns of breakage in animal bones found at fossil sites in South Africa along with the remains of Australopithecus africanus. And he thought, these were the results that this pattern of breakage was the result of Australopithecus breaking the bones to use as tools and weapons because he didn't find any stone tools at some of these sites. American playwright and science writer Robert Ardrey visited South Africa in 1955 and he became really enamored with this idea and this led to what he called the killer ape hypothesis outlined in his popular 1961 book African Genesis, a personal investigation into the animal origins and nature of man. And he outlined the idea that hominids were bloodthirsty, gruesome, savage and even cannibalistic hunters. So in 1981, two books had a significant impact on really initiating the hunting scavenging debate in paleoanthropology. On the left is the hunters of the hunted. Um, South African researcher Bob Brain used comparisons with modern carnivore den assemblages to reinterpret the breakage patterns of fauna in South African cave sites that Dart was studying. Um, and he thought they were mainly the result of carnivore activity rather than human butchery activity. And on the right is Bones, Ancient Men and Modern Myths. Um, and in this book, Lewis Binford also challenged the assumption that broken bones were always attributable to human butchery behavior. And he presented detailed data on taphonomic patterns on bones resulting from prey butchery and consumption by Nunamute foragers of Alaska, as well as similar data from wolf dens. And he compared and contrasted patterns of bone breakage and bone surface modifications created by human and non-human predators. So one of the main behavioral traces of butchery that zooarchaeologists study, in addition to looking at what animal skeletal parts are present and how they were broken, is bone surface modifications. So um, the role of hominins in modifying bones found in faunal assemblages in the early Stone Age in Africa at archaeological sites was unambiguously established beginning in 1981 with the identification of distinct morphology of stone tool cut marks on over two dozen fossil animal bones from Kubifora, Kenya and Olduvai Gorge, Tanzania by Henry Bunn, Rick Potts and Pat Shipman. And you can see some of these images from that paper on the left. Um, and so cut marks are produced by the contact of sharp edged stone tools on bones to find striations of variable length, often parallel to one another or otherwise clustered, usually with internal striations and a V-shaped cross-section. Um, so those pictures on the left on the top are slicing and scraping marks um, on a fossil from DK1 at Olduvai Gorge, and on the bottom are slicing marks and also two scratches from um, an equid bone from the site of FLK Zinge at Olduvai. <clears throat> In 1988, um, a new set of marks were recognized, percussion marks, which are inflicted by hammerstone and anvil breakage of bone. These were recognized by Rob Blumenschein and Marie Salvaggio as an additional unambiguous trace of hominin activity for which the extracted tissues were marrow and other edible tissues within bones were different from those associated with cut marks. And the, the extracted tissues associated with cut marks are skin, muscle, and tendon. So percussion marks are produced during the process of breaking bones open with a hammerstone to access marrow. And they occur as roughly circular pits or grooves, you can see on that top right image, impressed onto a bone surface just by the natural protrusions on a hammerstone or an anvil. 
They're usually associated with patches of microstriations in or emanating from the mark. You can see that really well on that top right photo. And they're often closely associated with hammerstone impact notches, which are kind of um, arcuate um, um, notches on bones that happened sometimes during percussion. So they documented percussion pits and microstriations on experimentally hammerstone broken antelope bones or bovid bones. So while initially cut marks were interpreted as indicating access to fully fleshed carcasses, subsequent research showed that cut marks could be the result of access to fully fleshed carcasses or the removal of marginal scraps of flesh left over from carnivore consumption or desiccated carcasses or carcasses stiffened by rigor mortis. Um, and I should mention before I go on, those marks on the, on the bottom right are um, percussion striations. So sometimes you don't get a pit, but you just get those striations that are associated with percussion. So beginning in the 1980s, several researchers conducted actualistic studies with the aim of producing referential frameworks to determine whether the frequency and location of cut and percussion and carnivore tooth marks differed in experimental scenarios reproducing different access to carcasses by hominins and carnivores. And the aim of this was to see if we could determine an order of access by hominins and carnivores, who got there first. So as limb bone mid shafts generally best survive a whole variety of taphonomic processes, they're usually used when calculating bone surface modification frequencies. So um, when um, carnivores, uh, sorry, when um, hominins have um, sole access to carcasses in both ethno-archaeological and actualistic samples. Um, humans uh, butcher fully fleshed carcasses to access flesh and bone marrow. This is the hominin only scenario. Between 5 and 40% of mid-shaft fragments are cut marked and 10 to 35% are percussion marked. And I should say when carnivores or particularly spotted hyenas have sole access to complete bones, there's no cut marks on them, but well over 50% of mid-shaft fragments are tooth marked. In dual pattern or hammerstone to carnivore assemblages, in which humans hammerstone break and extract marrow from long bones, and then carnivores have access to them afterwards, usually with spotted hyenas, less than 20% of mid shaft fragments are um, percussion marked. And following, um, and when humans have secondary access to just flesh scraps left from carnivore kills, so carnivores are there first, usually big felids, um, the mid-shaft cut mark frequencies are typically less than 10%. So one problem with these models outlined above is that several studies have found inconsistent relationships between the amount of flesh on bones prior to butchery or the amount of flesh removed during butchery and the resulting cut mark frequencies. This is probably because of variations in experimental protocols, the size and species of the carcass, butchery intensity, what actual butchering activities are occurring, including skinning, disarticulation, and defleshing, and potentially even stone tool raw material. So it's likely that the anatomical location of bone surface modifications, especially cut marks, is more important than the frequency of cut marks in determining the order of access of hominins and carnivores. In other words, where hominins are actually doing the butchery can tell you whether they're probably butchering big muscle masses or just flesh scraps. So the most recent iteration of this debate has largely focused on exchanges over interpreting the well-preserved fauna in the FLK-22 or Zinjanthropus site from Bed 1 at Olduvai Gorge dated to about 1.84 million years ago. So on one side of the continuum, Lewis Binford proposed that the taphonomic patterns on the Zinj fauna indicated that hominins were obligate marginal scavengers of only flesh scraps and marrow left over from carnivore kills. And they basically played a minor role in the creation of FLK Zinj. On the other hand, Henry Bunn suggested that these taphonomic patterns indicated that the hominins were competent hunters or at least of smaller sized prey. They perhaps aggressively scavenge larger prey by interrupting feeding predators and taking what was left of their meals and that they were the major bone accumulators of this fauna. In 1995, Rob Blumenshine weighed in and he used percussion and tooth mark evidence from Zinge. He rejected the hypothesis that carnivores enjoyed first access to marrow and long bone cavities at Zinge. So um, in his view, Binford is wrong. Hominids were not marginal scavengers, but so is Bun based on a high proportion of tooth marked long bone mid shaft fragments since carnivore access to long bones wasn't exclusively or even primarily 
secondary to butchery and marrow extraction by hominins. He concluded that the sequence of carnivore and hominin access to long bones and their carcass tissue yields was more complex, but it was consistent with the dominantly passive scavenging mode of carcass acquisition by hominins, following probably big felid primary access. Blumenschein had a series of PhD students in the late 1990s, including Sal Capaldo and Marie Salvaggio, who also did experimental taphonomy and applied their findings to the Zinge assemblage. They both proposed a three-stage model of hominin and carnivore access there. So first, flesh specialists like big cats ate most of the meat from the bones, leaving tooth marks on long bone mid shafts. Then the hominins used stone tools to remove flesh scraps leaving cut marks, and to break bones for the marrow, leaving percussion marks. And finally, bone-crunching hyenas munched on what was left, leaving additional tooth marks on the ends of long bones. <clears throat> Other researchers, especially Manuel Dominguez Rodrigo um, of the Complutense University in Madrid started to chime in. Um, and this has really still been an ongoing bait. Um, and so zooarchaeologists continue to disagree about how to interpret the evidence from FLK Zinge. Um, and in press, this has been called scholarly near warfare between opponents. But they largely agree that most of the bones found at this site were transported there by hominins, and that both hominins and carnivores extracted nutrients from carcasses there, including hominin extraction of both meat and marrow. And we can see that in evidence from cut and percussion marks. But the main disagreement is whether hominins there access largely fleshed or defleshed carcasses. And the most recent review and restudy of this assemblage has been done by Jennifer Parkinson of the University of San Diego. So, but could hominins have just been hunting animals right from the beginning? The answer is probably no, because the earliest solid evidence for hunting technology isn't archaeologically visible until about half a million years ago, with these spear points from a site in South Africa called Kachupan, and they have diagnostic impact fractures, indicating that they were definitively used as the tips of weapons. So maybe before this time, hominins were hunting with unmodified rocks or sharpened sticks made into spears that haven't preserved or other basically archeologically invisible tools that we haven't figured out a way to detect in the prehistoric record. So at the root of this hunting scavenging debate are important questions about the significant evolutionary consequences of the changes in hominin behavior and ecology with the dietary shift to acquiring, consuming, and probably sharing animal tissues. So if we reframe this debate, what we really want to know is there a functional association between early Stone Age artifacts and fossil animal bones found at prehistoric sites? When did hominins begin to eat tissues from animals larger than themselves? And which hominins were eating these animals? How likely is it that the earliest animal tissue consumption included scavenging? What kinds of animals were being butchered and eaten and in what landscape settings, what habitats and what seasons? How often did consumption of animal tissues occur and how much did animal tissue consumption contribute to the diet relative to other foods? When did animal tissues become a common or important part of the hominin diet? How predictable was the availability and acquisition of animal foods by hominins? And finally, did animal tissue consumption lead to food sharing among hominins? Modern humans exhibit a much higher degrees of food sharing and intra-group cooperation during food obtaining activities than any other primate. So sharing meat, which is a high quality protein rich food may have led to increased overall consumption of animal tissues by hominins, which has been proposed as a driver of biological changes during human evolution, including body size increase, brain size expansion, as well as behavioral changes, including eventually the development of a sexual division of labor and paternal investment in mates and offsprings. So I think these are the questions that we should be focusing on some of them might be unanswerable with the lines of evidence that we have now, but I think some of them are answerable. If we assume that hominins weren't hunting the prey that they butchered before half a million years ago, they may have obtained what I call edible carcass resources, muscles, skin, brains, viscera, marrow, and bone grease, basically any type of tissue from a dead animal from scavenging the remains of already dead animals. So two main modes of scavenging have been proposed for hominins, passive scavenging and uh, confrontational, also called active or aggressive scavenging. 
Passive scavenging, as I mentioned before, is when a secondary consumer waits until the primary consumer is completely finished consuming their prey and then moves in and takes what's left. Active or confrontational scavenging, as in this great Mauricio Antone reconstruction on the right, um, is when a secondary consumer interrupts the primary consumer and prevents them from finishing consuming their prey. The main implication or assumption about the difference of these two kinds of scavenging is the amount and quality of animal tissue that's assumed to be available for consumption. Um, active scavenging or confrontational scavenging is assumed to yield ample amounts of a variety of kinds of animal tissues, including meat and organs and within bone nutrients. Um, and actually data from studies of modern human scavenging in rural Uganda indicate that Modern humans armed with even simple weapons can chase carnivores from kills in successful active scavenging. But confrontational scavenging may not even require manufactured tools. Small groups of modern humans, especially if they're acting in a coordinated and cooperative fashion, just by holding up sticks and yelling, can drive a partially sated lion or leopard from its kill. So, um, what about previous studies about passive scavenging? So passive scavenging has long been assumed to involve opportunistic, infrequent access to nutritionally marginal amounts of animal foods, likely to be pathogenic or putrefied, but modern observations, which I'll describe, counter these assumptions. So two main kinds of passive scavenging have been hypothesized. The first is scavenging from temporarily abandoned kills of solitary predators, such as tree stored leopard kills, which is pictured here between feeding bouts. And in their pilot study of the persistence of tree stored leopard kills in the Serengeti ecosystem of Tanzania, John Cavallo and Rob Blumenschein found that three goat sized bovid carcasses they observed persisted as scavengeable food resources for an average of about 28 hours, which greatly exceeded the duration of the same size bovid carcasses killed by terrestrial predators. And the leopards always abandoned partially eaten kills for prolonged periods, leaving substantial resources for an opportunistic diurnal hominin that could climb trees. They did note that these kills are more predictably located and less prone to seasonal fluctuations in abundance than terrestrial kills. They require low search effort and basically no pursuit effort. But potential animal tissue yields from tree stored leopard kills have not been extensively investigated or quantified. I think this is a great research opportunity. The secondary type of passive scavenging um, that has been proposed are permanently abandoned kills of social or solitary predators such as saber-toothed cats due to satiation or anatomical limitation of extracting the remaining food. So based on his observations of lion kills in the Serengeti and Ngorongoro, Blumenschein initially described the characteristics of a passive hominin scavenging niche as largely focused on small amounts of abandoned flesh and all marrow from all felid kills, from abandoned felid kills of medium sized adult herbivores like wildebeest and zebra, or even larger amounts of abandoned flesh from saber tooth kills if their predation was concentrated on large herbivores. So felids are usually assumed to be the optimal predator to scavenge from. They have a more limited ability to access within bone resources um, compared to hyenids and canids and the larger the carcass, the less likely they are to be able to access within bone resources or even consume all the flesh of a larger carcass. So Blumenschein outlined variables that could affect the quality of a scavenging opportunity. These include the carcass size, the carcass habitat, the initial consumer type, including the predator body size, the feeding group size, and the ability of that predator to expose edible tissue. And then also the ecosystem predator prey ratio. This can be seasonal where herbivore migratory herds occur, and it can affect the level of competition for carcasses. Some of these variables should theoretically be possible to detect in the fossil record. Several studies have investigated aspects of carcass availability from passively scavenging lion kills in East African ecosystems by Rob Blumenschein in the mid 1980s in Tanzania, Martha Tappan in Virunga National Park Zaire in the mid 1990s, Manuel Dominguez Rodrigo in the late 1990s in Masai Mara in Kenya, and Agnes Gidna more recently in the Acacia Savannah woodlands of Tarangiri National Park in Tanzania. 
So now I'll talk about some of my own research on this topic, which was published in 2015 in the Journal of Human Evolution. In 2002 to 2003, I spent nearly seven months in a modern game reserve now called Olpegeta Conservancy in the Lakipia uh, province of central Kenya. It was called Sweetwater's Game Reserve when I did this study. Um, and you could see this here on a zoomed in map of Kenya. I simulated passive scavenging and I went to Olpegeta Conservancy because it was a lion dominated ecosystem with few spotted hyenas. And this was different than the predator um, guild in all of the previous um, passive scavenging studies. Um, most models of hominin scavenging are based on interactions with large felids like lions, leopards, or saber toothed cats. So I thought this was a really good model for um, passive scavenging in the past. <coughs> My methods were pretty simple. Um, after finding out about a carnivore kill from a variety of sources, I would wait until the predators, which were mostly lions, this ecosystem was, was highly dominated by lions. I would wait till they were completely satiated. Um, this picture that I just showed on the top right is um, a pair of young male lions that would hunt together. And um, the one that is like rolling around in the road has a belly full of warthog. So, I would go and document what was left on their kills. Um, and I, I, in some sense, I don't know if I really simulated passive scavenging. I, I had a four wheel drive vehicle um, and I had an armed guard with me. I was not interested in becoming one of my own subjects. And in fact, I collected the remains of these carcasses after they were done for another part of my study, which is um, documenting, describing the patterns of chewing damage by different predators. So in the time that I was there, I collected 24 kill samples from several different species of carnivores, which you can see in the left column of this table. And I'm going to really just focus on the lion sample. It's my largest sample, and it's the most relevant for modeling passive scavenging. <clears throat> I separated the prey into two size divisions. Um, basically related to how we classify the size of animals when doing archaeological studies. And I call them just large and small here. The large animals were over 250 pounds. Um, and so that's it. in this ecosystem, mostly zebra and larger bovids like buffalo and eland. The smaller animals were less than 250 pounds. And those are smaller bovids like impala and gazelle, as well as warthog. So I would document the location and estimate the amount of meat left over after the lions had their fill. And you can see what some of these leftovers looked like. The top right picture is a zebra rib cage with quite a bit of meat left on it. Um, and the bottom right picture is a part of a limb of a young Grant's gazelle with almost no even flesh scraps left on it. And so I used a definition of bulk flesh and flesh scrapped flesh scraps defined by previous researchers. F so flesh scraps were defined as less than 10% of the original flesh mass was present. These include only small bits of flesh still adhering to the bone, approximately less than the size of a normal human's palm and area, but larger than two to three centimeters and 150 grams. I guess, I guess it's basically something worth going after. So those are flesh scraps. And if more than 10% of the original flesh mass was present, this was bulk flesh. And these I just had to estimate. So how much meat could a scavenger eat from large prey? I will walk you through this graph before I show you the results. The x-axis on the bottom is the skeletal element or bone arranged in groups from left to right with the total sample size of each bone listed in parentheses. The first group are two hind limb bones, the second group is three forelimb bones, the third group are the five bones of the torso, and the far right three group of three are the head and neck bones. And the y-axis is the proportion of those bones in all samples with three different levels of flesh availability. And you can see that on the bottom, I've colored them like a traffic light, where green is bulk flesh flesh, yellow is flesh scraps, and red is no flesh. So you see lots of green and yellow here. Um, so in these larger kills, so things like zebras, buffalo, and eland, um, over 50% of the bones were abandoned with large muscle masses still on them, and that's in green, and 95% of bones had either bulk flesh or flesh scraps. That's the green and the yellow. Um, and this actually accords with some other studies. And so um, Gidna et al.'s observations found that 62% of buffaloes consumed by lions, and this is in Tarangiri and Serengeti in Tanzania, sorry, Tarangiri in Tanzania, that they were abandoned with various degrees of bulk flesh. 
Um, and so these, I think, well refute the argument that passive scavenging doesn't afford significant meat yields, at least from large animals. But what about small animals? Same graph, or at least same axes, different story. So only a single bone on my smaller lion kills retained bulk flesh on it. About half the bone still had some scraps of flesh, which you can see in yellow, and the other half were totally defleshed in red. So an important result of this study is that if you're hominin scavenging from a felid kill, the size of the prey really matters. So what does this mean in terms of meat yield though? We can use the weights of an adult wildebeest pictured here, which is a very common size of animals found in the archeological record. So using an estimate of four calories per gram of meat, um, we get 19 pounds for, uh, sorry, I'm not gonna get into the calories per grams of meat yet. So we have 19 pounds on a fleshed hind limb, two pounds on a defleshed hind limb. So the hind limb with only flesh scraps less, left. A whole defleshed carcass would yield potentially 12 pounds of meat. That's about 2,200 calories. Now we can use an estimate of four calories per grams of meat. This makes over 2,200 calories from a wildebeest. And so for those of us that eat um, Five Guys, one of the fast food restaurants in the US, that's like over 10 Five Guys burger patties from a wildebeest that has been deflushed by a predator. So what does that mean for our Homo erectus who we saw on the first slide? There's an estimate that um, Homo erectus daily caloric requirement was between about 2,090 and 2,290 calories per day. So a single larger sized carcass killed by lions and abandoned with only flesh scraps remaining could have been substantial enough to meet the total daily caloric requirements of at least one female Homo erectus adult individual. That is without even breaking open the bones to get at the marrow inside. Marrow from the 12 major long bones from a non-fat depleted adult wildebeest is about 3000 calories, which would have more than satisfied the daily caloric requirement of another Homo erectus with less than 30 minutes of processing time. The net yields of extracting brain and flesh can be even higher sometimes by two orders of magnitude. So now I'm going to take you on a short whirlwind tour of what we know from the zooarchaeological record. And I think some of the debate in the hunting scavenge, some of the issues in the hunting scavenging debate are really due to the conflation of the importance of what are actually two important shifts in dietary behavior from an evolutionary perspective. The first shift is the initial appearance of the consumption of animal tissues from larger animals, animals that are larger, faster, and stronger than a single hominin hunter. This would likely have been an opportunistic, occasional, possibly seasonal behavior contingent on local ecological context. So at present, the claim of the earliest evidence for hominid butchery is in the form of possible stone tool marks on two 3.4 million year old fossil animal bones from Dakika in Ethiopia. And then two other Ethiopian sites, Gona and Bori, including some of the bones pictured on the right, dating to 2.6 and 2.5 million years ago, respectively, also preserve a handful of butchery marked bones. A lot of ink has been spilled, maybe digital ink, um, about whether some of these marks are actually butchery marks or marks made by crocodiles or other predators. But really the importance of these sites is they signal the beginning of a dietary shift in hominin carnivory, I think to occasionally and only occasionally butchering and eating animals. The entirety of the evidence for hominin butchery before 2 million years ago consists of 33 bone fragments, as of a, a study I published last year, a review, at four sites, Dakika, Gona, Bori in Ethiopia, and Ain Boucherit in Algeria. The evidence includes butchered bones from bovids, equids, and other less toxin taxonomically uh, identifiable small, medium, and large-sized mammals. And the butchery behaviors reconstructed from these cut and percussion marks include tongue removal, evisceration, skinning, disarticulation, defleshing or filleting, chopping, scraping, and hammerstone breakage. Interestingly though, if hominins were largely processing these carcasses for marrow versus meat, you would expect a higher proportion or number of percussion marks versus cut marks, regardless of how those carcasses were initially obtained. But most of the early butchery evidence on these pre-2 million year old fossils in the form of bones with cut marks and percussion marks um, is a predominance of cut marks, 29 bones, 
versus bones with percussion marks, only four. And actually there's only a single bone from this time period that only has evidence of percussion without accompanying evidence of cutting or scraping. This could be because percussion marks are more difficult to identify, especially if analysts lack experience with controlled butchery collections, or this could be a real signal. All right, so the second shift is the more regular consumption of edible tissues from larger animals. And based on current evidence, this happened by about 2 million years ago, when we have the first evidence of what we call persistent carnivory and access to small animals. This evidence comes from Kanjara South in southwestern Kenya, and this is research I was involved in, not the excavations, but of the studying of the fossils. So at Kanjara, there's clear evidence from hundreds of butchery mark bones that hominins acquired and processed relatively complete small animal carcasses for meat and marrow. Um, we infer that they got to these animals first before other predators and butchered the meatier parts of them. Um, that's because of the completeness of the bones and where the butchery marks are located. They basically, these parts wouldn't have even been left or had any edible resources on them had predators gotten there first. The hominins at Kanjara also had at least occasional access to meat and marrow from larger sized animals, and they were probably scavenging this prey. But an important difference between this and those earlier sites with butchery marks that there's, is that there's evidence from butchery on bones from three stratigraphic intervals at Kanjara, which spans hundreds to thousands of years. So the Kanjara hominins were coming back to the same place over and over again to butcher animals. This is why we call this persistent carnivory. It gives us a sense that this dietary behavior is becoming more important or at least more commonplace. So by at least a million and a half years ago, and probably 1.8 million, million years ago, there's the third shift, and that is early access to carcasses. This comes from, sev the evidence for this comes from several different bone assemblages from the sites of Olduvai Gorge and Kubifora, dated at 1.8 and 1.5 million years ago, respectively, with hundreds of butchered bones. And there's evidence from the skeletal parts that were transported and butchered that hominids had early access to larger animal carcasses. So they were able to get the meatier parts of these larger animals, not just the smaller animals. And the photos here are of butchery marks on a one and a half million year old fossil bovid leg bone from Kubifora. And this is an assemblage that I excavated and studied also as part of my dissertation research. There were three sites there that I studied that had 272 cut mark bones, 27 percussion mark bones. Um, and at that time, this was the largest number of butchered bones from this time period when I was studying them in the um, mid early 2000s. And the specific butchery behaviors that I identified included tongue removal, neck disarticulation, limb disarticulation, and a lot of limb defleshing, as well as scraping the periosteum off of long bones to prepare them for marrow extraction. Even with a lot of evidence for butchery, the hominins at Kubifora at one and a half million years ago did not exhibit any preference for animals of a certain size or specific skeletal elements or specific limbs. And there was also no evidence for preferential butchery of meaty skeletal elements. And in fact, there was a significant correlation between the frequency of limb elements and the marrow wet weight at one of these sites. And it was nearly significant at another. So the hominins there seem to be transporting and or processing limb bones according to their marrow yields at these sites. Um, on the right, um, the picture here is of a mammal size three, so kind of um, uh, larger size, but, but uh, mid-size long bone mid shaft. And this has a tooth mark overlying a cover. Um, this is unmistakable evidence that the butchery happened first and the carnivores got there later. Um, so the hominins there were able to somehow control access to these carcasses um, early on, even if they weren't hunting them. So why are some researchers so anti-scavenging? Um, so I think it's probably because of the assumption that scavenging is a less complex and sophisticated behavior than thing and couldn't have led to food sharing and other more modern human-like social behaviors. But is this true? Competition with and scavenging from large predators may have favored coordinated movement, group cohesion and defense, goal-directed carcass port transport to specific points on the landscape just beyond the closest refuge, 
and even the ability to rapidly disarticulate large carcasses with stone tools to minimize time spent at, pre at prey death sites. So once a successful scavenger encounters a carcass, it also must be able to both outcompete and stave off potential competitors to monopolize and then efficiently process the carcass. If hominins were discovering carcasses in different locations on the landscape, then where stone tools needed to process those carcasses were located, um, as well as different locations and preferred plant food, scavenging may have selected for characteristics like social cooperation, planning depth, and detailed mental mapping. The, in, the emergence of endurance running or long distance running has been proposed as an adaptation to securing sufficient access to scattered and ephemeral carcasses or to signal the location of carrion or dead animals to others. Although this behavior is usually more often linked to hunting live prey. Um, a recent paper in the Journal of Human Evolution um, earlier last year concluded that Homo erectus would be able to persistence hunt large prey for over five hours without drinking and therefore without the need to carry water. Successful confrontational scavenging would have yielded immediate tangible proof of the benefits of cooperation, a steady supply of high quality nutrients. So the benefits of cooperation were established in one sphere, cooperative strate strategies could have spread to other behavioral domains and increases in cooperation could have selected for genes that promoted cooperation or suppressed strongly competitive behaviors. Confrontational scavenging may have involved covering long distances in social groups and possibly led to the evolution of language. Um, in 2001, Derek Bickerton and Iris um, Sadmari suggested that language and cooperation on a human scale are so distinct from behaviors in other primates that they require a trigger of some kind. And they suggest the only activity practiced by hominids that contained all the necessary components for that trigger was confrontational scavenging. Whether I agree that scavenging led to language is another question, um, but I think it's an interesting proposition. They suggest that hominin group members who had located a carcass would have had to use sounds, gestures, or mimicry to inform a potential recruits of what they had found. They note that reference to absent entities, the things you can't see, is the first step towards symbolism, which is the capacity that underlies all of human cognition, including language. So, what do I think are next, next steps in um, kind of this research agenda? So I think um, the expansion of, of early hominin diets to include scavenged animal tissue really needs to be considered with respect to the local density and seasonal availability of other foods that likely formed the substantial parts of early hominin diets, like nuts and seeds and underground storage organs, insects, and even various aquatic resources like fish and shellfish. So it is important to remember that I think the inclusion of scavenging in the reconstructed dietary behavior of animal tissue consuming hominins doesn't mean that hominins were obligate scavengers, but rather that scavenging was one of several modes of large animal carcass procurement by early hominins. And even some of the staunchest critics of the idea that scavenge of the idea of scavenging agree that hominins practiced a sophisticated and flexible strategy of carcass acquisition. It probably would have included active scavenging of meeting the large mammal carcasses when the hominids could intimidate and outnumber carnivores, and probably also less frequently included passive scavenging. Um, smaller animals are not likely to have scavenged because based on observations of modern predators their remains would have been virtually consumed, or at least the edible tissues would have been virtually consumed by primary predators, unless hominins were scavenging from smaller or more timid carnivores. So here are some next steps that I see in investigating and interpreting possible hominin scavenging. So um, I think we need to um, examine more fossils, particularly um, studying and restudying fossils older than 2 million years from assemblages for traces of human butchery. Um, I think we need to develop better taphonomic methods, um, especially to determine the relative abundance of felids and hyenas within fossil assemblages um, where traces of human butchery have been documented. Um, and, and really further developing our ability to recognize unequivocal zooarchaeological and taphonomic traces of scavenging, including those left, left by hominins, carnivores, and crocodiles. 
I think we should collect more data from scavenging foragers, um, either generate new data or re-examine previously collected um, scavenging data from modern forager groups. We should continue to pursue the economic traces that can distinguish between predator taxa, and this is an active part of my research, or at least predator body size, observe more small felid kills and natural death assemblages. Um, <clears throat> So to document animal tissue resources available from small and medium carcasses like pre-stored leopard and terrestrial cheetah kills, um, and conduct experiments on carcass tissue edibility persistence um, to see the time of the length of time that various carcass tissues would remain edible. So I want to thank um, the government of Kenya for research permissions, the various funding entities, um, and support from organizations and individuals that helped me complete this research. <laughs>